everybody. Okay, so today we're going to touch upon the perineum. Um, it is the outside, con basically pelvic floor continued, but on the outside. So we've learned about it from the inside. So to kind of maybe bridge that gap, let's go over what we know so far. So remember the hip bones in the, um, in the pelvis. You have your sacrum, then you have your um, iliac bones, you have your ischial bones, and then you have your pubic symphysis or the pubis, right? Okay, so when you have those things, they're going to make up your entire pelvis. Pubic symphysis is what attaches both ends of your pelvis anteriorly, posteriorly, the iliac or the ala of your um, iliac bones, the wings, ala means wings, attached to your sacrum, okay? So, oh, my bad. So here it is labeled pubic symphysis, your sacrum, your sacroiliac joint, your iliac bone, bones, sacral ala. Your ala means wings, okay, in like Latin and Spanish. That's why you're going to see that word. Um, so if you know the bones, then we know the attachments and everything. This is another way of looking at it. Um, we have our obturator canal. Then we have our pelvic inlet and outlet, which we're going to go over in a minute. Your pubic symphysis is the anterior attachment of your pelvic bones. It's a secondary cartilaginous joint. It's really important because there's a lot of structures we're gonna talk about today in relation to the pubic symphysis or the pu pubis in general. Um, even in regards to just generally like the lower part of the pelvis, like the ischial tuberosity, et cetera, especially when it comes to ligaments. Okay, so um, just keep that in mind. That's why we're quickly showing you this again. Okay, so the most important ligaments, these two ligaments is the, are the sacrospinous ligament over here from the sacrum to the ischial spine and the sacro tuberous ligament from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity, okay? Um, then you see the scary uh, image from osmosis of all your, or your main, um, I'm trying to move. Yes, okay. Of your main um, ligaments in your pelvis. So your sacro spine and sacro tubers, which we touched upon, and you have your iliolumbar, you have a few others, but the main, two main important ones are the sacro spinous and sacro tubus, which sacro tubers, which you know, are from sacro spinous from your, uh, from your sacrum to the ischial spine and then sacro tubers from the sacrum to the ischial tuberosity, okay? It's within the name, so inshallah that part will be hopefully clear, okay? So now you have your pelvic inlet and your pelvic outlet. So what we're going to be focusing on today is the outlet from the inside and from the outside, okay? So the pelvic floor is what we talked about last time in, in our pallor, like if you guys remember from your pelvic floor lecture, these are the slides from your pelvic floor lecture. Um, it's holding all your viscera and people think, okay, it's all, only holding the viscera of like my pelvis, like the bladder, the uterus in females, um, prostate in males, etc. cetera. But um, that's not true. Actually, your pelvis is literally holding everything above that as well, like your abdominal muscles, the weight of that, the weight of all your viscera and your abdomen. So your gut, your colon, your, you know, small intestines, everything. So there's, gen there's a lot of pressure on your pelvic floor and that's why it is built a certain way. That's why there's so many muscles interconnected with each other and so much connective tissue as well to support all of that, because there's a lot of stress on your pelvic floor. Okay, but today what we're going to be learning about specifically is what that looks like and the outlets, um, the holds in your, or like the defects in your pelvic floor that basically lead to the outside to your perineum and how your perineum is built. Basically looking at it from the very, you know, inside um, from your pelvic floor where that starts to the outside, to your skin, okay? So what we're gonna try and do is go through all of those structures. Now, if you guys are confused at any point, let me know. It is completely normal to be confused. There might be parts where I get confused as well because there are so many structures. So um, don't worry about it, okay? We're going to go through it together. So, you know, you have your pelvic floor. This is formed by your, your levator ani and coccygeus muscles. Your levator ani muscles are formed by multiple muscles, okay? By your pubococcygeus and your iliococcygeus. These are all over here. Now you're going to see something on the outside. It's going to talk about your urogenital hiatus, your urogenital like uh, triangle. Over here, you can see your urogenital diaphragm, which, which has your urethra, vagina in females, anal canal in both males and females. Um, and then over here, you have this triangle, which is known as the anorectal, okay? So it's where you're going to have your anal canal. Sorry, this is from the outside, so I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and that's for basically like the focus of like fecal continence and stuff like that, urinary 
issues and um, genital urinary issues in general, you're going to be looking like superiorly, okay? So this is a pelvic floor in both males and females, a very, very simple diagram. So you have your pelvic floor muscles, your levator ani muscles, you have your bladder, your prostate, your bowel in males, but in females, you have the addition of your uterus and your vagina, okay? We know the functions of all of these. We just talked about it, urinary and fecal continence. We talked about it in our last lecture. But just a reminder, because there are certain structures in your perineum as well that are responsible, for example, for... Um, that are also like responsible for the support of your viscera. And let's just say if there's any damage to that, you can have pelvic organ prolapse, which is basically where they start to fall outside of your pelvis through like the vagina. This is more common in females, of course. Okay, so these are the muscles that we talked about. Um, this is what it looks like inside. This is the pelvic outlet, your pelvic floor. It's literally like a, sh it's like this, it's a bowl. Literally, if you see a pelvis and the muscles, it's literally like a bowl. It's not flat like this, it's like a bowl. So it's holding everything. So literally imagine a bowl, just holding all of your viscera. That's literally the pelvis, okay? So over here, you're going to have your um, hiatus. So over here, you're going to have your urinary genesis, urinary openings over here, your anal canal. Um, these are all your levator, lev levator ani muscles. And you also have your coccygeus muscles towards the back, okay? Over here. So I won't go into all of these specifically, but you do know them. So for example, your puborectalis is right after your purectal fibers. Then you have your pubococcygeus, then you have your iliococcygeus, then your coccygeus, okay? Okay. So we'll talk about we already talked about prolapse, so let's talk, okay. Now let's talk about the actual perineum. So let's go back to the structure of our pelvic floor. We have our levator ani muscles. Over here we have our urogenital diaphragm that has a urethral opening, vaginal opening as well in females. So over here we can tell it's of a male because you don't have a vaginal opening, you only have a urethral opening. Um, and over here, you're going to see the coccygeus muscle as well and the pyriformis muscle. So this is looking at it. So let's just say you're taking, um, you're looking inside the pelvis. Okay, so like you're looking literally at it from the inside. So this person, let's just say their head is towards you, their feet away from you. And that's the angle that you're looking at their pelvis. This is what you're looking at right now. Okay, so let's go on. So over here now, this is where a lot of the anatomy is going to start to come in. We're going to first focus on the muscles, okay? We have perforations in our muscles. We've literally talked about it. So we talked about the urogenital diaphragm, so the urethral and vaginal orifices. That is anteriorly. You notice that you have your urethra and you have your vagina. And behind that, you have your anal orifice or your anal canal, okay? We can see that over here. This is of a female and then this is of a male. Of a female, you'll see the vag vaginal opening over here. In a male, you won't. Of course, you're only going to see the urethral opening. In both, you'll see the anal canal, Okay. So your perineal body is what we're going to talk about today. That is one of the most important structures that you guys need to know about. Um, if you forget anything, just remember the perineal body. I'm not even kidding. That's one of the most important things that they want you to know. So for the perineal body that is in between the vaginal canal and the anal canal or the vaginal orifice and the anal orifice in females. And in males, it is in between the anal orifice or anal canal and the, um, the, and the testicles. If you look at it like that, from the outside in a male. But if you wanna talk about it literally over here, it's in between the anal canal and the urethral opening because there's no vagina in males, okay? Um, a raf or rafi is basically um, connective tissue. It's a connection basically tying together both of those muscles. Tying is not the right word to use, but you guys know exactly what I mean, okay? This is what you need to know. Okay, so this is from this is from the outside as if, let's just say, um, a woman is in lithotomy position, basically the position that we call when a woman is giving birth in the hospital. So legs abducted and you're looking at the perineum straight. This is what you're going to be seeing, obviously with skin overlying it and connective tissue and the superficial and deep perineal pouches. But this is the muscular, these are the muscular layers basically of the pelvic floor from that angle, okay? All right, so perineum. So anteriorly, let's first just talk about the perineum borders, okay? The perineum borders, look at the perineum as kind of like a diamond-shaped thing, okay? So you can see it's almost like a diamond shape over here, 
or like a really ugly square, I guess. Um, but anteriorly, you have your pubic symphysis, which we talked about. That's the anterior connection of your hip bones. Then you have posteriorly your coccyx. Okay. Laterally, you have your ischial tuberosities. Over here, do you guys remember what this is? This is your sacrospinal ligament. Sorry, this is your sacrospinal ligament. This is your sacrotuberous ligament. Lateral so ischial uh, pubic rami, one on each side. They form the anterior slope side. And then the sacrotuberous ligaments over here, one on each side, they form the posterior. So if this is the bottom, this is the top of the person. Coccyx, sacrotuberous ligaments, ischial pubic rami, pubic symphysis. That is what you guys need to remember, okay? Any confusion so far? Do you guys hear thunder outside? Any confusion? So far, or is it good so far? Look at us, we're already on slide 25. <laughs> um, so, okay, uh, no one's saying anything. So I think up until now, it's pretty clear. If you guys have any confusion, please, please just stop me. Feel free to unmute um, or put it in the chat, but I can't see the chat too quickly or too often. So just like, let me know, okay? Don't feel shy. All right, so going on, um, we know the muscular layer. You guys know what that looks like. So you know the pelvic floor muscles. That's all we have talked about so far with the orifices and the borders of the perineum, okay? Now, um, for a minute, let's just talk about how it actually looks, the perineum, okay? Then we're going to talk about all the in-between stuff, all the superficial and deep perineal structures, okay? So this is a female, this is a male. I think it's pretty obvious from the way it looks. Over here, you see a vaginal opening. Over here, you see a penis and the testicles. And over here, um, let's talk about the urogenital, um, the urogenital triangle over here. And then as well as the, so the anorectal, not really, the anal triangle, not the anorectal, the same thing, anal triangle, okay? So over here, you see the, you'll see the vaginal opening from the outside. This is urethra, this is the clitoris, okay? Over here in the males, you'll see the, tes the testicles and then the penis in the uh, urogenital opening because the urethra is coming through the penis. It's not a separate opening. Um, and then in the anal uh, triangle, it's the same as females. You're only going to see the anal uh, aperture, anal orifice, anal canal, okay? So you can put this into context if you can imagine the muscles behind as well, okay? So now let's look at the superficial perineum. You have the anal triangles bound by the tip of the coccyx on each side and the sacrotuberous ligament. So let's go over that again. So if we draw these triangles over here, I wish I had like a pen on my thing, but it doesn't allow me to draw. Um, this is your urogenital triangle. This is your anal triangle. Okay, just follow along with me. So your anal triangle, you have your sacrum, the borders of sacrum, your sacrotuberous ligaments, and then you have your border of the gluteus maximus muscle. Okay, and then for the urogenital triangle, you have your pubic arch. It's bound by your pubic arches, okay, and the ischial tuberosities. So over here. Now looking at it, sorry, superficially, you can see the skin, um, underlying fat, and the fascia, and we're going to talk about which fascias are which, and then deep and superficial, because especially in males, that is very important. Um, and then females, we're going to talk more about the significance of the perineal body. Okay, so over here, you can see the perineal body right over here. It's like, um, it's, we can call it like the attachment point of everything. It's almost like the city center. <laughs> it's very, very important. It has all the structures attaching to it. So damage to this can cause damage to your pelvic outlet in general. And that can cause um, pelvic floor um, dysfunction and therefore prolapse and pelvic organ prolapse, okay? But over here, you can see the superficial transverse perineal muscle. This is also um, one of the borders of the urogenital triangle and the anal and the anal triangle. Okay, so this is connecting your perineum to the ischial tuberosity. Okay, this muscle right over here, and it also acts as a border. So again, looking at the perineum, you know the superficial perineum. We can see the skin and the fat, and we can see what that looks like inside. So this is the uh, anal aperture. This is the uh, anal opening, and then the rectum anal canal and then the rectum and this is sigmoid colon going above um but this is what you need to know is basically the ischiorectal fossa okay so the ischiorectal fossa its uh, base is a superficial skin okay 
medial borders of levator ani muscles in the anal canal over here. And the lateral borders are the lower border of the obturator internus and its fascia as well. Okay, so the obturator internus and its fascia. So this is all the ischiorectal fossa. Ischiorectal fossa is filled with a lot of fat. And why that's important, for example, is because when you are defecating, you need space for expansion of your anal canal for the um, fecal matter to actually pass and then to exit into the from the anal or uh, anal orifice, right? So this allows that to happen. You have your muscular attachments, which are allowing for sphincter, you know, closing as well as opening, relaxation, um, and then the fat. It's easy to move out of the way, so that's why this is built like this. Okay. So the lateral border, again, is like the lower border of the obturator internus and its fascia. Then the floor, anteriorly, we have the urogenital diaphragm, which we talked about, the urogenital diaphragm. And posteriorly is the fat of the fossa. It's continuous to the fat tissue of the perineum and the gluteal region, okay? Now, the contents are the fat, like we talked about, and you can see over here, the pudendal nerve, which is really, really important. It's a branch of the sacral plexus. Um, and they all run in the pudendal canal. It's called Alcox canal, okay? Um, and then outside Alcox canal, you have crossing the space transversely are the inferior rectal vessels. So the branches of the internal pudendal, um, which is which runs the, through the pudendal canal, and you have your inferior rectal nerves, which are branches of the pudendal nerve. Okay, so these are actually um, these are structures of your deep perineal patch as well, your pudendal vessels and your um, and your nerve. Okay. So looking at the urogenital diaphragm, let's look at it a little bit more like this. So we have the male and female over here. Um, over here, let's take a look at this a bit further. So we're going to talk about the erectile tissues as well. And the erectile tissues are located in your superficial perineal pouch. Okay, it's really important to remember. So over here, you're, they're going to, you're going to see them after the muscular layer, after the layer that's holding your pudendal uh, vessels and your nerves. Um, and your uh, Cowper's glands, for example, in males. After that, you're going to see the erectile tissues more uh, superficially. That's in your superficial perineal pouch, okay? So the erectile tissues in males and females are slightly different. Um, over here, you can see the glands of the penis, the body of the penis, um, and then the, I guess, equivalent structure in females is the clitoris. And we can see over here the roots, um, the glands of the clitoris and then the body of the clitoris. And this is what fills up with blood. So for example, in males, when males get an erection, it's because of the filling up of blood into the vasculature of their penis, okay? Now we know that we have your arteries and veins. And how does that work basically? Because of course, at any time of the day, your blood is passing through your arteries and then being taken back by your veins. And there's a reason it's not staying there. It's because of vasodilation, vasoconstriction. So what happens, for example, in like um, a sexual stimulus, for example, is your veins are going to vasoconstrict, but your arteries will vasodilate. Maybe it's the other way around. No, I think that's correct. And therefore the blood is going to go into your, for example, the body of the penis, and it's going to stay there, but it's not going to be able to drain out. Okay. So it's going to stay there until that stimulus is finished or until somebody achieves, for example, an orgasm, um, then the blood flows back normally because of vasodilation that is achieved by the body. And any issue in that, usually leads to sexual dysfunction or something known as priapism. They're two completely, completely different things, but you guys will learn about them later if you guys have not already. Have you guys heard of those things before? Okay, perfect. Great. Okay, so that is really important because, of, of course, when you're learning anatomy, you need to understand why you're learning the anatomy. It's sometimes difficult when there's so many structures to see why it's important, but it is because of the clinical correlations. Okay. So it provides an attachment and support for the external genitalia and supports the urethra. That's all for, uh, in regards to your uh, perineal pouches. Okay. So now let's look at this actual, actually like the superficial layer or like the actual perineum itself. Um, outside. We've talked about the skin, we've talked about the borders, we've talked about the erectile tissues in the superficial perineal pouch, and we've even talked about some of the structures in the ischiorectal fossa and the deep perineum. But now let's put that all into context. So let's take this area. Now imagine that you're um, looking, this is from, again, like head to, uh, what do you call it? If someone's head is towards you and their feet are away from you, that's the, uh, that's the angle that you're looking at the pelvis from right now. Okay. 
So you have your superior layer and you have your urethral opening. You have your deep perineal pouch. You have your superficial perineal pouch, which is not really labeled over here. And you have your perineal membrane. Your perineal membrane is the most superficial um, structure out of all of them, okay? So let's look at this over here. So we talked about the opening of the urethra. So just imagine this over here, okay? In your genital diaphragm. So this is going to be the, sorry. Yeah, this is going to be the uppermost um, structure. So the transverse perineal ligament, you're going to find this right under the pubic symphysis, okay? You're gonna have your urethral opening. Then at the bottom you have over here, your perineal membrane. Um, you have a line of attachment for the margin of the urogenital hiatus and, and the levator ani. And over here, you're going to find your transverse superficial perineal muscles that are attaching to your perineal body, okay? So now let's look at that with more muscles and more of the structures. So over here, we talked about the urethral opening. In a male, of course, you do not have the vaginal opening, um, but you have your deep transverse perineal muscles, okay? Over here in a female, you have your vaginal opening as well, okay? Over here, you can see the sphincter, the urethral vaginal sphincter. And over here, you can also see the deep transverse perineal muscles as well. So just um, think about this. This is, of course, in your body. We've already talked about this, but we're just basically detaching it to look at the structure specifically in the perineal pouch. Okay. You have your deep transverse perineal muscles, like we mentioned, um, and then you have your superior, superior inferior levels of fascia. These are the fascia of your urogenital diaphragm, UGD, urogenital diaphragm. Okay. Now look at it in this context. So imagine we took this and we took, it's a, it's, it's a trapezoid. So let's just say we took the shorter end of the trapezoid. That is your superior part. And then the longer part is the inferior part, okay? So over here, you have your transverse perineal ligament, okay? It's also labeled over here, transverse perineal ligament. This is all your fascia. You have your urethral opening. In a male, you don't have a vaginal opening. You'll only have your perineal body attached to your perineal um, muscles, okay? Your deep transverse perineal muscles. In a female, it's not shown over here, but you're going to have the vaginal opening over here, okay? And over here in both, you're going to have then the anal triangle. So that's going to have your anal orifice as well as the fat and all the contents of the ischiorectal fossa under the skin and under the muscle. <coughs> Sorry. So over here, we can see, for example, this is how it looks. Um, imagine it kind of like a disc, your perineum or your perineal fascia, your perineal membrane. You have your deep perineal pouch. And then outside the deep perineal pouch, right over here is your superficial perineal pouch, which you, where you'll see all your erectile tissues, okay? So they're not within this fascia. They're superior to that under it, okay? So you'll see all your... Um, your erectile tissues over here. In a female, you're not going to have all this. It's going to just be the glands of the clitoris and then the erectile tissues of a female. Okay. Do you guys understand this so far? Is there anything that you need me to touch upon a bit more clearly? Okay. Great. So I'm just going to move on. Over here, sorry, one last thing that's important to note is the dorsal vein of the penis. It is passing in between the pubic symphysis and the transverse perineal ligament, okay? So now let's look at the fascias. And the fascias are really important because again, there is a clinical correlation as to why you need to know this. And we will talk about that briefly. So you have your male structure and your female structures, okay? So these are both, imagine men and women, both in like lithotomy position. So they have their legs abducted and you're looking straight at their perineum. Over here, you can see the penis. You can see um, bulbospongous muscle. This is uncovered now as if we lifted the fascia. And we have our deep perineal muscles, transverse muscles, which are, really, which are attached to the perineal body. And under that, we have our anal orifice. In the female, we have our perineal body over here, deep transverse perineal muscles over here, your vaginal opening, urethral opening, the clitoris, um, and then under we have the erectile tissues, which we can't see as clearly over here, okay? Actually, over here we can, never mind. Uh, bulb of the vestibule. We can even see the arteries coming, and these arteries come from the pudendal vessels that are in the deep um, perineal pouch, okay? 
So posteriorly, there's two layers that fuse with each other. It's called collies and bucks fascia. Can you guys tell me a bit about collies and bucks fascia, like what you know about it? Hello, and if you tell me. And if you don't know, that's fine. Okay. So you have a deep and superficial fascia. So you have your Bucks and Collie's fascia. So Bucks fascia is known as your more deep fascia. It's around the shaft of your penis. And then Collie's fascia spreads out a bit farther. So let's talk about that in a bit more. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. But first, just a quick practice question. So which of the following structures is not found in the deep perineal pouch? A, your internal pudendal vessels. B, Cowper's glands. C, erectile tissues. Or D, membranous urethra. What do you guys think? Hello, guys. Okay, so one said D. Um, other attendee, what do you think? Okay, so answer, you said D. Now, why, why do you think it's membranous urethra? Okay, well, let's go over the answer. So it's actually erectile tissue. So remember that we said that the superficial perineal pouch holds the erectile tissues. Um, oh, no worries, it's okay. Everything else over here is in the deep perineal pouch. So your internal pudendal vessels, nerve, um, your Cowper's glands and males, uh, and your membranous urethra. Because your membranous urethra is farther back. It is not, um, it's not like your bulbar urethra. But either way, majority urethra is in the deep perineal pouch unless it is extending out into the shaft of the penis, okay? No, correct me if I'm wrong. So why are we talking about the abdominal wall? Because we talked about Bucks and Collie's fascia, which we were talking about over here. So let's look for that. So superficial, Collie's fascia over here. And then you have, where am I looking? I just saw it two seconds. There you go, deep fascia over here, Buck's fascia. Like I said earlier, it is around the shaft of the penis, whereas Kali's fascia will um, extend outwardly more and is more superficial, okay? But now why do we need to know this? And why are we talking about the abdominal wall? What does that have to do with anything? Thought we were talking about the perineum, right? Well, the Bucks and Kali's fascia, specifically Kali's fascia, is a continuation of the anterior abdominal wall fascia. So we're gonna talk about that right now, okay? And why it's important to know, we'll also talk about in a second. So. Knowing the actual layers of your abdominal wall is important for this. So, you know, you have your skin, then you have your superficial fascia, your fatty layers, so as camper's fascia. Then you've got scarpa's fascia under that. And then you have your deep fascia covering your external oblique muscle. Then you have your muscle, so your external oblique, then your internal oblique, then your transverse abdominus muscle, and your transversalis muscle. And then you have your extra peritoneal fascia, then your parietal peritoneum. This is going from a superficial to interior, okay, to deep. So superficially skin, then we ended up in the parietal peritoneum. Okay, but you see how many layers of fascia there are? So some of them continue down into the perineum and into your genitalia. So let's look at that. We talked about camper's fascia. Camper's fascia is your superficial fascia, it's a fatty layer. So what happens is that comes down here and your scarpus fascia actually, over here we talked about that, it's a superficial fascia. This is so you have a fatty and membranous layer. The fatty layer is known as campers. Membranous layer is known as scarpas. Okay. So the membranous layer, because you don't have fat continuing down into your genitalia, is that's what becomes your scarpas fascia becomes your collies fascia. Okay. Now your bucks fascia comes from your 
deeper fascia, okay? But the interesting thing is Buck's fascia, your deep fascia, only extends around the shafts of the penis. It does not go, for example, around the um, testicles. It doesn't go further than that the way um, Coley's fascia and Darda's fascia does. Darda's fascia and Coley's fascia are the same, they're just the same thing, okay? Um, like same superficial fascia, I mean. This continues to your perineal body. And um, this also extends to your inner thighs as well. And so of course, from your up, from your lower abdomen, which we talked about, scarpus fascia continues down around the shaft of the penis as well, around the testicles and to the back, okay? But your deep fascia, Buck's fascia, only extends to around the shaft of the penis. Is that clear so far? Is there anything that you need me to go over once again over here? We're almost done. Okay, so I'm going to assume that you guys are good with this. Again, if you guys need me to stop at any time, just let me know. So let's look at that again in context, slightly more uh, zoomed in. Over here, you can see your perineal body, your perineal membrane. These are your transverse perineal muscles. Over here, you can see Buck's fascia, okay, covering. Then you have Kali's fascia over here, which will surround all of that, okay? Buck's fascia goes around your vessels and erectile tissues, the body of your penis, whereas Kali's fascia will also go around that, but will also extend to your inner thighs and to your lower abdomen, okay? Kali's and Darda's are the same thing, so superficial perineal fascia, okay? It's like the same derivative. Buck's fascia is also known as, I honestly don't know how to say this nicely, Galadez fascia, that's your deep perineal fascia, okay? So we're Buck's deep, Coley's superficial, okay? Your camper's fascia ends over here. Fatty fascia does not, the superficial fatty layer does not continue down. It's only the membranous layer that continues down. So remember that, okay? Just went over this. So in a female, the perineum, this is what it looks like. So you have your Buck's fascia and your Coley's fascia. Buck's fascia is your deeper fascia. And in your Coley's fascia, again, it's like your superficial fascia. Um, and then you have camper's fascia over here. Camper's fascia, again, is your fatty layer. Doesn't continue in the shafts of the penis in a male. Um, that's the most important thing you guys need to know, okay? So this is the external covering, basically, of your perineum. Is there anything that you guys need me to go over? We've went over the muscles. We went over the vessels. We went over the nerve. Um, your terminal branches of your nerves and your vessels all end up in the superficial perineal pouch, supplying all the structures around. Um, but is there anything that you guys need me to go over for this? Or are we good? Perfect. Okay. So let's quickly again go over concepts of the deep perineal pouch. So you have your membranous urethra, your sphincter. Uh, your urethral sphincter, your deep transverse perineal muscles, and in your cowper's glands and nails, okay? So you can see that all over here. You can even see all your vessels. This is all in your deep perineal pouch. You can see the veins. You can see the whole neurovascular bundle over here. Um, you can see your membranous, your urethra. This is all within your deep perineal pouch. Uh, you can see the dorsal vein of the penis. Remember that the dorsal vein passes in between the pubic symphysis and the transverse perineal membrane. It's very, very important. And um, your superficial fascia over here, your Kali's fascia covering everything. So your Buck's fascia is your deep fascia. That will be, for example, in males around the shaft of the penis, around the erectile tissues in females as well. The Kali's fascia is covering all of that superficially, okay? In the female perineum, we just talked about this as well. So we can go over it again. You have your bulb of the vestibule. These are your erectile um, tissues, your Bartholin's gland as well. This is all within your deep perineum. So there's an absence of Cowper's glands. And remember, again, the Cowper's glands are only present in the males. You have a vagina over here. You do not have a vagina in males, of course. And you also have your urethral sphincter, your, sorry, urethral sphincter over here in females, okay? Um, is that clear? I think so far you guys have said that's clear. It was just rep repetition. So you have your perineal membrane, Buck's fascia covering your uh, tissues, and then you have Coley's fascia on top of that, which is superficial. Now, reminder, why 
are you expected to know this? Do you guys know the difference, for example, in between, do you guys know why we ask about this, for example, for like clinical correlation? Why do you think this is important? Just take a guess. It's okay if you don't know. Okay. So we need to know about it in cases of urine extravasation and also blood. So for example, trauma, um, any issues in any of the fascia, we need to know. Urine extravasation is when there is any injury to the urethra and urine is exiting from the urethra into your surrounding tissues instead of properly outside of your body, okay? Instead of outside the urethral orifice, it is entering into the tissue surrounding. Now, why is it important to know which fascia is intact and which is not? Now, let's talk about, for example, if you have trauma, okay? If you have trauma to the genital region, and let's just say a penile fracture occurs, a penile fracture is, we know penis is not a bone, I mean, technically, with penis, for example, can, especially when it's erect, it can act like that. And what happens is any type of bending that is abnormal or like more than a certain angle that is not, um, you know, that the fascia cannot compensate for, it'll end up in a fascia, like in a fascia tear. So you'll have a tear in the fascia. So if you have a tear in Buck's fascia versus um, Coley's fascia, that will basically tell you. Okay, so let's just say you have a tear in Buck's fascia, the blood can exit from Buck's fascia into the surrounding tissues. And because Coley's fascia continues on, that means that the blood can continue on. But if Buck's fascia is intact, and if there's any bleeding due to any trauma or injury, for example, to your urethra, and there's any blood extravasation or urine extravasation, that's going to stay within Buck's fascia. So only within the shaft of the penis. So I'm going to show you guys an image really quick. Um, just stay with me for a second. I'm open the screenshot over here. I think this is a great image to show you guys what happens. So let me go back to... Okay, if you guys look at this image over here, so for example, if you have injury to Buck's fascia, which is your deep fascia, what happens is if you have a tear in there and there's any blood or urine, it can exit out, especially like blood, for example, it can end up in something like this where you have a hematoma, blood collection spreading to your inner thighs and to your lower abdomen. And it can be so bad that it can extend up to your clavicles. This is like the highest extension basically, okay? Like this is like the farthest it can go, but that, that is in like more extreme situations, but this can happen. So that's why you need to know, because if you're wondering, for example, okay, this person had like trauma to their genitalia, why is the blood spreading like this? Then you know, for example, about Buck's fascia and Collie's fascia. Buck's fascia is a deep fascia continuing from the deep fascia from your abdom from the abdominal wall down around the top of the penis. But Collie's fascia is a superficial fascia, which is surrounding all of that, but also extends to the inner thighs and lower abdominal wall. Okay. That is very, very important for you guys to know. So is that clear? Okay, so with that, we're almost done. Just a few more slides left. So this is just a reminder. This is a really, really important concept um, because it doesn't only come up now, it does come up in the future again. It's something that I was actually asked about in my urology rotation. So they will definitely ask you about that. Let's just say when you're rotating in urology during your surgical year and fourth year, um, and they might ask you about it on your exam. I remember this was something that they did ask us about when we were learning about it in first year uh, or second year. We took end repro in second year when I was doing preclinical. All right. Okay. So rupture of the urethra can lead to extravasation of the urine in the superficial perineal pouch. Okay. That is because of how the fascia is surrounding the pouch. Okay. So a 33 year old man is triaged in the ER after a motor vehicle accident on examination. A hematoma is noted that spans from his genitalia to his thighs and lower abdomen. Which affected structure is responsible for this? What do you guys think? Is it A, deep perineal membrane, B, Buck's fascia, C, Coley's fascia, or D, all of the above? Okay. 
take a guess, even if you have no idea, it's fine. We can talk about it. Okay, so you said D. Okay, but we just talked about it. So when there's injury to which fascia, when will it start to spread everywhere? Okay, so the answer is, sorry, I didn't mean to put this around C. This is supposed to be around B. So if there's an injury to Buck's fascia and there's extravasation outside of that, let me just reshare that with you guys. Just share it here, it's fine. Okay. If you guys have um, injury to Buck's fascia, then there can be extravasation outside. Remember, Coley's fascia extends a little bit farther. It's more superficial. So that's why the blood can spread and it can look like a butterfly pattern. Okay, that's usually what it's described as a butterfly pattern um, of your hematoma spread to your lower abdomen, to your inner thighs, and to the rest of your genitalia, like the testicular sac as well. Okay, so that is it. Thank you guys so much. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Okay. Um, and also, please just feel free to email me. Feel free to contact me via WhatsApp. I'm perfectly fine with either. And um, this is your QR code. I'm happy to any and all feedback on what I can improve on, what I could have explained better um, for the future. So thank you guys so much.